It's a, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here, and I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today about the work that we're doing at LS9, uh, where I'm a scientist, and, uh, and how we think it's, it's going to change the world. So um, I'd like to start out by talking to you about something called flux. Now, I'm guessing that um, when I say the word flux, the first thing most people think of is uh, the flux capacitor. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen this movie, uh, Back to the Future in 1985, I'm sorry, it's a great movie. You, should, you can do that after the seminars today. Um, but uh, in the movie, the flux capacitor is um, sort of fictional scientific advance the scientist uh, Doc makes that allows him to turn a car, a DeLorean, into a time machine and uh, requires plutonium to, to travel backwards in time. And at the, at the end of the movie, he comes back uh, with, with a souped up version where he's been to the future. And instead of using plutonium, he's got this thing, Mr. Fusion. And Mr. Fusion is the power for the, the new DeLorean. And what is he feeding it? But he's, he's putting in beer, banana peels. He's just scrounging around for whatever is there. Um, so at LS9, uh, we're not in the business of cold fusion or time machines, but we are going to be in the business of turning trash, waste, into fuel that someday you may have in your car. OK, so back to flux. What I mean by flux is the flow of something like energy or matter through a system. And at LS9, we are concerned with the flux of sugar into a biological system that can be turned into fat. Now, this should be familiar to you at some level. You know, if you sit on your couch drinking sodas and eating cookies, uh, you'll use some of that sugar for uh, staying warm, thinking, walking to the fridge to get another soda or something. Um, but for the, the energy that you're not using, some is waste, but some is going to get turned into fat, right? Well, this is a common thing in all biological systems, that sugar can be converted into fat. And um, that's the, the problem that we are working on. And meanwhile, there are other companies that are working on the problem of converting waste into sugar. So waste into sugar, and we're going to be converting sugar into the fatty molecules that are very similar to the fuels and chemicals that uh, are in products today. And we want to be able to replace those fuels and chemicals, which today are sourced from petroleum, which with essentially the same molecules, but instead uh, made originally from agricultural or, or municipal city wastes. So before I get into the science, I'd like you to just imagine for a minute you know, how that might change the world. Right? Um, how the growing world economies secure access to energy and raw materials is a major issue that's, that faces governments and, and leaders of today and tomorrow. Um, imagine that that energy is going to come in the future from a variety of renewable sources, right? Solar, geothermal, wind. But there are certain applications where liquid fuels are going to be critical, such as heavy machinery and, and trucks and so forth, because uh, you, you need a very high energy density to be able to power such, such big equipment. And there, biofuels can really make an enormous impact. So the, the fuels that we're developing using biology and from these, these biological sources, like agricultural waste, um, will be drop-in compatible with existing infrastructure. They'll be cost competitive, and they'll have a dramatic reduction in the carbon dioxide that uh, is emitted during the process of production. So this will make our civilization uh, more efficient with our limited resources. And it's just a more sustainable solution. We can't just continue to, to dig in the ground for things that we're just going to burn and, and, and throw away. What I'm here today to tell you about is, is our vision of how we'll be able to use biology to do that conversion from, from sugar into useful products. And uh, the way that we do that is using engineered microorganisms 
as essentially microchemical factories. Now, the cell is already a factory, in a sense, a chemical factory. Um, this is a map of metabolism that's, that you can find online, uh, published by Sigma. Um, and what I hope you can take away from this is that it's, it's really complicated, right? I mean, there are flux lines all over the place. There are all sorts of uh, different chemical reactions that happen in the cell. And think about how complicated it is. I mean, in order for a system to be able to uh, replicate itself, make another copy of itself, with all these different components, with the, the DNA, the genetic program that, that tells the cell uh, how to make all the, the proteins, and, and uh, you have to make all these intermediate chemicals, and, and ultimately you have, to make, you have to make fats, because fats are what, is, uh, what are the precursors to the, the cell membrane. Okay. So the cell is already a chemical factory of sorts. And what we need to do is find a way to recommission that factory to do what we want it to do. So consider, for example, the, the, one of the most well-studied organisms in, in nature, um, E. coli. E. coli is a simple bacterium compared to you know, humans, say but still has many of the chemical reactions that you, you observe uh, in this map. There are 4.6 million base pairs of DNA, thousands of genes. They code for all these different proteins. Many of those proteins are enzymes that perform a lot of these chemical reactions. And the challenge that E. coli has faced in the course of its evolution is to be able to, to manage the flux under a bunch of different conditions manage where does the energy and, and mass need to go in this, in this complicated diagram. Any cell that's not efficient enough will lose out to its brothers and sisters that are more efficient, and that's natural selection. We can use this as a platform for making our own chemical factories. So, as an example, I've simplified the map down to this. <laughs> um, this is glucose, a model of glucose, and these two molecules are products that, that you can buy, that we can use, that we use in our everyday lives. This molecule is, is kind of like a soap, it's a detergent, and this is a biodiesel, it's a fuel. Now I hope you can see that this soap-like molecule is actually very similar to this one, and this biodiesel molecule is, is quite similar to, to the way this one looks. The cell already makes these molecules. They're called fatty acids, and those are the precursors to the cell membrane that, that keeps the cell intact. So what I hope you can see by looking at this is the cell's actually doing a lot of the work that, that we want to get done, right? Going from something that looks like this to something that looks like this requires many, many chemical steps, many chemical transformations. The cell breaks that down into little pieces and then builds up these long chains, okay? All we need to do is like, essentially a polishing step at the end, right? We need to take these two oxygens and get it down to just this one, one group at the end. Same thing is true for, for biodiesel. You just have to sort of polish this, change this molecule at the end, and put on this other one. So it, there's only a couple of steps to go from what the cell already makes to what we want the cell to make. The, the challenge is getting the cell to produce that at the industrial scale. So let me tell you about another product that, that we're interested in making, and that is a, a group of molecules called alkanes. Alkanes are a major component of, of fuels. For example, you know, when you go to the gas station and you fill up, you put you know, 81 or 8, 8, 91 octane or whatever in your car. Octane is an alkane with, with eight carbon units. And uh, at LS9, we've discovered enzymes in nature that can convert these molecules that the cell already makes into alkanes with slightly longer chains, you know, 13, 15, 17 carbon units that, that can still be used as fuels. Okay. Um, it requires two genes, just two, just two, two enzymes make, this, make the transformation from the fatty acids into alkanes. Okay, so how did we discover that? Scientists at LS9 knew that certain, mi certain microbes called cyanobacteria made really small amounts of this of this molecule. And they studied a bunch of related organisms, all cyanobacteria, very similar, cousins of each other. 
And they noticed that one didn't make any alkanes, and a bunch of the others did. So they took the genome sequences for the 10 that made the, the alkanes and looked for all the genes that were in common, and then they subtracted all the genes that appeared in the organism that didn't make any, because they guessed that there should be a difference, right? You should have the genes in this pool, and they should be absent in the one strain that doesn't make it. And when they did that computational exercise, they discovered just a handful of genes that could have been responsible. And pretty quickly, using com computer, what's called a homology search, you can narrow it down and figure out they actually were just the two. And they cloned those into E. coli, and sure enough, the bacteria made alkanes. Okay. Like I said, the major challenge is how do you then scale up from a strain that makes a small amount of something to the industrial scale? That's a big challenge that our company is facing. So since we're at a business school here, I'm going to pose it to you as a case study. Okay? How, how would you take a factory and recommission it to make a new product? Because we want to take the E. coli microchemical factory. It's already making a bunch of stuff and have it make something else. Okay? I would argue there are five steps that I'm going to talk about, and maybe you guys will come up with 100 others. Um, but I'm not a business guy, I'm just a scientist. So there are five relevant steps, and I think they are, um, number one, know your factory, right? You bought a factory, it makes something else, what does it make? What are you good at making, what are you not good at? Number two, you want to make a new product, you've got to install a new assembly line. Okay. Number two, you want to make something new Has product, anybody else done that before? Where do you get the equipment? How do you train the, the workers to now use the new Has equipment? Else done that before? Where do you you got to just get started, right? Third step is you got to optimize that assembly line. How do you make it you just get started. go really fast? Third How do you make sure that steps one, two, and three all go at the same speed so you don't accumulate some half-baked product? Step number four is making sure your factory provides you with the proper infrastructure. Do you have Step electricity where you're, you're going to put the, the, the assembly line? Do you, have, do you need water? Do you have, do you, um, where you're put the, do you have the raw the materials that you need you water. to keep that assembly line running you have the at raw maximum materials that you need And finally, that as I'm sure I don't need to tell you here, you need to have good management. Right? You need to have a supervisor, sure make sure everything right goes smoothly. You need to have good okay, management. so now I'm going to tell you how those you need to have supervisor, five things make sure everything goes okay. are relevant to what we're trying to do with our you know, microbial chemical factory, and how each of those essentially comes from a, a different field of, of biotechnology. So first, know your factory. We're using E. coli because it is the safest, most well-studied microorganism around. Now, probably when most people think of E. coli, they think of people getting sick. But that's a different strain, and the one that we use is a lab strain that people have used in the lab for decades without anybody getting sick, because it's missing huge pieces of its DNA that are required to, to infect people. So it's an extremely safe organism. And it's extremely well studied. There are databases online you could, you could pull up on your phone right now uh, with all the information about its genes, proteins, interactions, you know, this metabolic map type information, all the papers that have been published about every gene that, that has been investigated. So that's a great place to start. Second thing is install a new assembly line. So for us, that means how do we discover enzymes that do new types of chemistry to make the products that we want to make? I just told you the story about how we discovered the enzymes for alkanes, and being able to mine the, the databases um, that exist out there is, is a huge tool that we can currently use. But in addition to that, that data is, is expanding extremely fast. The cost of sequencing genomes is plummeting. It's, it's, going, it's getting cheaper faster than Moore's Law. And so the databases are going to fill up with information incredibly fast. And we'll be able to use that to find new enzymes. And the, the computational tools for comparing genomes, doing all that, uh, those tools are just getting better. An interesting development that's going to change how this happens in the future is fully computational enzyme design. Recent research shows that um, you might be able to take a basic protein structure and generate a completely novel type of chemistry that, that's never been seen in nature that's maybe not even possible, you know, in, in, a, in a chemistry lab. Okay, the third thing is optimizing your assembly line. For that, we use a technique that's called directed evolution. It's basically like natural selection. You know, you generate genetic diversity, mutations. You figure out which ones are beneficial. 
and then you take the, the beneficial mutations and you, and you recombine them just like nature does, except in the lab, we can do that extraordinarily quickly because we have computers, high throughput, DNA assembly, liquid handling, robotics. Um, there are all sorts of tools that, that we can use, and that field is also going extremely, extremely quickly. Fourth, making sure your factory provides you with the proper infrastructure. That's a field called metabolic engineering. And it's essentially the problem of, if you want to make a specific product, you want to control the flux through this network to maximize the precursors, the fatty acids in our case, that we're going to use as inputs to our new assembly line. And we also need to make sure that the cell has everything else it needs to survive, enough energy, uh, other, other chemical precursors that it needs for, for, for its, its own survival. Okay. Metabolic engineering is a, a quickly developing field as well. There's, uh, especially using computers uh, and new analytical techniques to look at the cell as, as a sort of global item to study. We can look at its RNA, its proteins, uh, its internal metabolites. We can look at all those things on a global scale. It's called omics, like transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. And the development of those techniques is allowing us to refine computer models and, allow, and enable better predictions of, uh, of how to modify this very complicated organism to maximize the flow to the precursors that we need to make the products that we're trying to make. And finally, management. How do we control what's happening? This is a small part of a brand new field called synthetic biology. I don't have time to go into all the different things that people are doing in that field, but it, it's, it's really accelerating at a dramatic rate. And what I'm just going to tell you about here today is how do you control things, how do you control things in, in your normal life? How does cruise control work? How does a, a thermostat work? It uses control systems that, that are, that where feedback is an essential element, right? When your car starts to slow down, it, it feeds that information back and pushes down on the gas. We'd like to be able to do the same thing in our biological system, where we set up a circuit inside the cell to sense what's going on and feed that information back to the control. And that is one of, of many different uh, topics that people in synthetic biology are looking at. So with just a couple minutes left, I'd like to just focus on uh, one final thing, which is that all these different fields of biotechnology are developing quickly. But the real power is being able to do all of them at once, because they can inform each other. If you have the sort of random approaches that you can use in, in directed evolution and in some of the metabolic engineering techniques, and you combine those with rational strategies, uh, or vice versa, you take rational approaches that can be enhanced with uh, directed evolution, for example, that's where the real power lies. And that's enabling us to move the technology ever more quickly. So the bottom line is we're combining all these disciplines to make sustainable fuels and chemicals from hopefully, ultimately, waste products that are just being thrown away and buried in, in the land right now. LS9 is, in the very near future, going to be moving the, some of these products to commercial scale. And we're confident that this will you know, be economically viable, sustainable, reduce carbon dioxide emissions, et cetera. There are many possibilities now coming into focus. Synthetic biology, directed evolution are really changing the, the scientific landscape. I hope that I've convinced you that there are all these technologies that working together can be even more powerful. And looking into the future, you know, if, if industrial biotechnology really can fulfill its promise, then a lot of the products that we use today, pharmaceuticals, personal care products, fuels, plastics, all sorts of things we haven't even thought about today will be made using engineered microorganisms that are being fed from waste streams like agricultural waste and municipal city waste. So we might not be putting beer and banana peels directly into our flying DeLoreans in the future. I'm not going to promise that. But I feel pretty confident in assuring you that someday soon, you may well be filling up your car with fuel that was made through engineered microorganisms and putting dish soap in your dishwasher that was made exactly the same way.
So with that, I just want to, uh, again, thank the organizers for inviting me here, thank people at LS9 for all their hard work, and, uh, and thank you very much for your attention.